ability with this machine. There's nothing but obstacles trying to stop me, but it doesn't matter. I'm on air now. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Can you believe it? I am actually on air after several attempts. But that's okay. I, but I like it because I know that I'm obeying God. Because this time it wasn't my fault. I don't know if the internet wasn't getting a connection or if the, if the cow jumped over the moon and ate the potato head. I don't know. But this is what I'm going to celebrate. I'm on air, glory to God. So we thank each and every one of you that are coming in and being a part of what God has called us to do. It's an opportunity once again to share the truth of the living God. And that's all I want to do. That's all I want to do. I want to celebrate the goodness of Almighty God. I don't know why I kept stopping, but it's above my pay grade. But one thing about me, I will keep firing shots until I figure it out. Because God didn't put any quit in me, and I don't stop because it's difficult. Is that your truth? So, I'm on air now, so let everyone know that you can. I know we're hitting Facebook, we're hitting YouTube, we're hitting all these different avenues. So I'm great. I'm glad to do that. But listen, if you got time, sign in on Spreaker because I'd love to hear from you because you can comment to me as I'm on air right now. So I'm going to send out a shout out to you just to send out a little blessing. Blessings to come on in. Come on in. Don't drink no gin and don't commit no sin. Come on in. Praise the Lord. If you can't see it because I had some issues, but the title of today's message is, I'm still in intimacy, but the title of today's message is Remember. And I got that from um, when God reminded me what he says in Isaiah chapter 43, 26. So I'm going to ask you to turn to Isaiah 43, verse 26. Because, yes, I'm still talking about marriage. Because, and, and the key thing and the most significant thing about the word intimacy, that it represents a unique closeness you have with God, uh, uh, his Lord, uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, your mother, your father, your cousins, your siblings, your brothers, uh, uh, your children. But this intimacy we're working on, we're talking about the intimacy between a husband and a wife because when you say intimacy to a husband and wife, it, excuse me, it includes that very close relationship where the Bible said, excuse me again, you are one, but it also means that you have to connect physically, where you can connect sexually, where you can invite the power and the glory of God into your bedroom, and you could have supernatural, God-inspired lovemaking with the woman of God and the man of God God called you to marry. Because remember, the significance of intimacy is that the human being was designed to have a desire for it. When you have an, a human being that does not want to be intimate, doesn't want to be close with others, that's usually because of the darkness or some, it could be mental health issues, or it could have been the fact that they opened themselves up and it just didn't work the way they thought it. But God wants you to be able to be intimate. He wants you to be able to be able to be intimate with him, intimate with your family, and especially intimate with the God-given spouse that he's given you. And, you know, as I said, I got this from, I got this from um, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 26. God tells us, he says, put me in remembrance. Let us argue our case together. So he's telling us, I want you to, I want you to be intimate. I want you to remember. And 
And so significant about this is because God is the one with the photographic memory. He never forgets anything. He knows everything. Because yes, he says, if you, if you repent, your sins are, are put in as far as the east meets the west. But he still has a flawless memory. But men, or human beings, can make a mistake. They, cannot, they, do not, they do not always remember. That's why I like to take notes. Because I got enough trying to remember what God tell me to do without me uh, not having some notes to help me bring back to my heart or my memory what God is saying to me. But he says, put me in remembrance. And this is what God did for me when I, when I went there with God is that he reminded me if I need to be reminded or I need to remind God about what he said, what he promised, what he's done in my life, I also need to remember what was the significance of my relationship, my vows, and my covenant with my spouse. Because in this thing, you know, they, they tease me about it, saying, I don't want to hear about your 40 years of marriage. Well, you're going to hear it again. We've been married over 43 years, praise the Lord. But I'm trying to get you to hear, we're not perfect, but we serve a perfect God. And what I keep doing is I keep searching my heart to try and understand and remember how I can properly grow in my marriage, even though we've been together these many years. And what God placed in my heart, you need to remember the significance of what you have or what you mean to each other or what you've done for each other or what kind of good, solid memories you have. As my anniversary was last week. So I kept trying to bring her back, remembering some of the things that we enjoyed as a married couple, some things that only she and I know. So I'll know if, if she told it, because I'm not going to tell it. But the point I'm trying to make is, if God telling you to remind him, he knows it. But he needs you, he's, the reason he tells you that is he needs you to keep repeating it so you know it. Uh-oh. Because sometimes we forget. I know I'm, I know I'm the only one. Sometimes we forget what God said what God has promised, what has God made happen on our behalf. But he's telling us that you need to train yourself to remember. Al Green wrote a song about it many years ago, For the Good Times. In other words, that song is reminding us that we need to remember the good times because in marriage, every day is not going to be a day at the beach. Because <laughs> when I say that, I think about it, I'll never forget, September 3rd, many years ago, we went to the beach on September 3rd, but they had a hurricane. <laughs> so we couldn't enjoy it. It was raining. It wasn't a bad one. I mean, we, it was on the residue of it. But what I'm trying to get you to hear, every day in a marriage is not going to be sunshine, your, your, uh, your belly out, you can go water skiing, jet skiing, parasailing, you can do all that stuff. Some days in a marriage, you're going to have to go back and remind yourself why God put you together. That's, that's Bible right there. That's a, good, that's a good reference to have. You need to remind yourself why God put you together. Because the word remembrance means bring to your recall, remind you. I mean, yeah, you need to keep it in your spirit. You need to keep it in your mind. He says to cause you to remember. To keep reminding yourself, because I remember this gentleman some years ago would always go visit his wife at the nursing home. And she was in such a debilitating state, um, they told her, say, sir, she doesn't know who you are, doesn't recognize you, but yet you keep coming. And the man said, the husband said, I come because I remember who she is to me. Whether she remembers me or not, I come because of what I remember. Because I always talked about, y'all probably say that too, I talk about my 96-year-old stepbrother-in-law. 
He was married to my stepsister for 62 years. And when I get him talking, he'll start talking about what a wonderful experience he had being married to my stepsister for 62 years. So you have to not just remember the bad times, because I can tell you there's going to come some days you're going to want to fight, you're going to bite each other's head off, you're going to want to run, you're going to want to jump, you're going to do anything but get along with your spouse. But you got to get into your spirit and say, Lord, remind me why you brought this woman into my life. Remind me why, Lord, why you brought my husband into my life. Remind me, Lord God, because you remember the cry I had when I was crying out about being alone. Lord, I don't want to be alone. Lord, I want to have somebody to share my life with, to share my ups and downs with, to help me get to the next level. Because He's wanting you to remind yourself, don't forget where you came from. Don't forget because one of the issues, especially if you've been married for a long time, is that you can take, you can forsake each other. You can get too familiar with each other. You cannot recognize what the other person, what the other person's likes or dislikes, or you may ignore them because Oh, they're not leaving me. No, I don't want to take that chance. So I'm going to apologize. I'm telling you up front, I'm going to say I'm sorry. I'm going to try and say things in a way that will draw her to me and not run her away from me. Because I said before I say it again, one of the things I always loved about my wife, especially with her siblings, when I first met them, they would have an argument. And I'm thinking they're about to throw blows and dishes and all like that. But no, they might raise their voices in an aggressive manner, but they never put their hands on each other. They didn't de destroy the house. They, um, they stayed in certain lane lanes, but they weren't saved at that time. Well, you know, they, they're adults now. It may take them a little longer, but <laughs> by the same token, they can still fuss and still get over it. And what that has to come back to me is what the scripture is saying is he says the reason I need to remember because I can forget the significance of what a person meant to my life. I can forget how important it was to have that person in my life. Because I remember that I got this from Bishop Jacob and I kind of think I know where he got this from. But you got to level these things up from one to ten. What may be a 10 to you may be a 1 to them. What may be an 8 to you may be a 6 to them. So you've got to balance each other out. But the point I'm trying to make, before you blow it off, before you say things that you can't take back, before you do actions that's going to cause issues into your relationship that you can't erase, remind yourself how important that person is to you. I wish we could look and be in his love as the day we got married 43 years ago. But up jumped the devil. We had issues. We had challenges. We had circumstances. We had children to raise. We had money issues. We had job issues. You know, uh, uh, I think that's cute, you know, because I've heard of that uh, the, uh, um, uh, um, the Jewish tradition that when you first get married, that you should take the year off and comfort each other. Well, that hadn't worked out for many of us. Because one, we don't know the tradition. Two, we can't go a whole year with no money. I did it, and it was fun. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. But we spent a lot of money because we kept everything rolling. <laughs> I was between jobs, and I was here, and it was either stay here or go back to go back to Baton Rouge where, where I'm from. And as I was praying and trying to figure out what to do, we enjoyed that time. We went everywhere we could think of. We, we visioned all the state parks in this area. We even went to the area where Bonnie and Clyde um, was last seen before they were uh, murdered. Well, they weren't murdered before they were executed because of their crime. But what I'm trying to get you to hear is that you got to keep memory. You got to remember the good parts, 
so you don't act a fool when the bad ones come. Because I'm, I'm going I'm to tell you, as long as you're married, there are going to be some times you're going to be so angry, you're going to tell your spouse how T.I. is. But you need to remember the good times before you screw up the next time. Because <laughs> that's a TV myth talking about, oh, I love it when we make up. I don't want to fight then try and make up. I don't want to fight, period, the truth be known. I like to, <laughs> I said this example, I like to walk in the dealership, pick out about 10 cars, and they give them to me. I like to go find the most prestigious mansions around. And I go and look at them, say the ones I like, say, oh, I'll give it. I want to go in the furniture store, get the designer from Gay Paris or, or, or wherever, and fill it with furniture and say, oh, we just, we give it to you because we want to be able to say we did. But no, that's not the way life is. There's some, actually, sometimes you're going to have to work through some issues. You know, that's why I lift up my children, my, especially my daughter and her husband. They've been married 20 years this coming August. They've traveled all over the world. They both have exquisite ca careers. Uh, my daughter is, a, is an attorney, and my son-in-law is a world-famous, world-renowned photographer. So they got, they got everything going for them. They're a good-looking couple. Everybody knows they don't think about one without the other. But God dropped in her spirit to have children. And she never really got serious about it but now she has. And now that she's gotten serious about it, I heard it out of her mouth. Now, I'm the father, and, he, and I'm the pastor, and this is grieving to hear. She said, this is the most challenging thing they've ever gone through. They've gone to North and South Africa. They've gone all over Europe. They've gone to virtually every state in the United States. But something you would think that would be easy to happen because according to the dictionary, according to the World Health Organization, when a male and female couple who's engaging in unprotected or unrestricted sex without any birth control, and they do not have a child within a year, they are considered infertile. And then I just read this up too, I didn't know this. After you have the first child, because I'm the only child my mother ever had. So apparently, well, then my father got killed a year and a half, but she, she could have gotten pregnant in there. But anyway, we could stay on point. You can be secondary infertile. But what I'm getting to all this, they have a great marriage. My son long time, we never argue. Well, that's not the way my wife and I, we have to work on that. But we've been married longer than them. But they're facing some challenges. But they got to remember the most important thing. And the most important thing, if God be for you, who can stand against you? Because doors are open for us to, for her to share. Matter of fact, y'all can look at um, Robin Mead's show from today, this morning. And you see Kristen Pleasant on there from Monroe, Louisiana, talking about what God is doing in her life. But he, he reminded me of this. He says, don't forget why God put that person in your life. Because God knows I needed my wife. Because if my wife hadn't come into my life, I'd probably have been dead and gone. So I need to thank God and I need to remind myself that God gave her to me. Before I go off, or before I say something, I'm going to eternally regret. But he says, put me in remembrance. You need to remind yourself why God gave you that person. You need to remind yourself why that person is in your life. You need to know that God has placed them there to help you and be the best person man or woman or God they called you to be. So you got to remember that. Because, you know, when I went to that, I put the word in remember in there. Because you got to recognize how important that person is in your life. Because when you love somebody, it's easy to forgive them. I see you, the honorable, the blessed, 
supernaturally fortified and the glorious man of God, Pastor Dennis Stephen Hamilton in beautiful Santa Barbara, California. We're working on remembrance because you've got to remember why God puts you together. You've got to remember the good times, not the worst times. <laughs> Y'all won't tell on me, will you? Um, you can tell when a man is dominant in a house, no women there, especially if the mother's there or, or they, they leave the lid up on the toilet. <laughs> well, I only did that one time. My wife woke me, woke me up in the middle of the night. Don't you ever leave that seat up. And you know what? I could have got up and argued with her for days. I'm the man of the house. I got authority over the, the porcelain throne. But you know what I did? I counted the time. It takes a millisecond to when I get through using the, uh, the porcelain throne just to put the lid down. It's just a simple courtesy to my wife. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Uh, when we built a house in Baton Rouge, uh, I was put in a three-car garage because I was gonna have two-car garage. And then uh, I got to liking toys like a boat and some other things. And so I said, why don't we just make it a three-car garage? And so my wife told me, um, that's fine, but you the one that's going to be parking outside because your daughter is going to be parking inside the garage with me. And I thought about it. You know what? <laughs> so that house ended up with a four-car garage, amen? Because <laughs> I wasn't going to park my car outside where I wasn't going to make my wife park the car outside. I wasn't going to make my daughter park the car outside. So, you know what? I come up with this intellectual decision. Guess what? <laughs> I'm going to make this. A, it wasn't that much more expensive back then to add a fourth garage. But that's what I'm trying to get you to hear. Remember the significance of the other person. Remember what they mean to you. If God's telling you, God knows his word, but he wants you to remind yourself to remind him because when you remind him, see, you know, this is what it gets me with people. They want to beg God. They want to plead with him. But show me in the Bible where that's where. I'm talking about the New Testament now. In the New Testament, he says, you have authority. You can make a demand on the word. Now, you can't insult God. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But you can put a demand on the word. You can say, ministering spirits, go and fulfill every word of God that's been spoken out of our mouths. You can say, in the name of Jesus, I have full and complete authority over every evil spirit, not people. I got authority over me, and I got authority over my young children, but they're adults now. I don't have authority over them. I have authority over demonic entities that would try and come against me. That's why... The devil may attack you, but he ain't fooling with me. Because I have authority over him and I'm using it in the name of Jesus. But what I'm trying to get you to hear, he's telling you, remind yourself what the word says. Remind yourself what that person means to your relationship. Because I know when you're dreaming, you're watching all that crud on TV, uh, my, my, my best example for me, y'all I, I think it's been off about 10, 15, maybe 20 years now. But we used to watch all my children when I was in college. And I got away from it when I got to working. But then the VCR came out, so I started recording it. And I got clipped into watching Erica Kane. That was the main character who had about 500 marriages and 10,000 lovers. But you know the thing, I always remembered her, her stage name, I don't know what her real name was, Susan Lucci. She was only playing a character because she was married to her beloved husband for over 50 years. He transitioned, I believe it was either earlier this year or, or last year. But she was married to her husband for over 50 years. So what I'm trying to get you to hear when God's telling you to remind him in Isaiah, 
43, 26. He says, put me in remembrance and let us argue your case together. In other words, remind yourself how significant your spouse is to you. Because if not, you will sit there and nitpick them. Uh, who is that? Barney Five would say, nip it, nip it in and nip it in the bud. You will nitpick them to the end. But if you learn, you got to remember the good things. Because uh, I raised my children. I changed their diapers. And, and uh, I'll never forget when my son was teething because he looked like he teased as soon as he came out the womb. And I had this beautifully starched shirt on. I was on my way to work. And, I, and he had been fed. And I picked him up. And he just drooled all over my clean shirt. So I had to change shirts. Now, I can sit there and hold that against this. My child is 36 years old. I can hold that against. I'm not going to speak to you because you drooled on my shirt 36 years ago. No, that wouldn't make good sense. It doesn't even sound like good sense, right? So you have to train yourself. Because a few sermons ago, we were going through forgive. God told you to forgive. God's telling you to remember the good things. The remember, the, remember the fact that they was willing to stand in front of a crowd of your peers and say, I love you and I marry you and kiss you and sign them, sign them papers. And then they was willing to stay there when he took them work boots off. And you're like, Lord Jesus, I know your feet smell like that. Y'all get that tomorrow. But look at Genesis chapter 9. Because when you look at verse 1, this is God speaking to Noah because of Noah's obedience. He spared Noah and his sons and their families. In verse 1, God says, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. He's telling that to your marriage, baby. When you go into marriage, you're going into a covenant with God and with each other. And he wants your marriage to be fruitful and he wants it to multiply. What does he want it to multiply? Blessings on top of blessings. What's that old song say? Every time I turn around, he keeps blessing me. Well, that's what your marriage is supposed to do. So you got to make the effort. You got to take the time to remind yourself to remember the good things about your wife, the good things about your husband, because I'm telling you, that's why I tell my wife I love her, because the Bible tells you in Romans, uh, in Romans, he says, faith comes by hearing and by hearing the word of God. So I got to keep saying the word. I think that's Corinthians because I was really thinking about uh, uh, Genesis 8 and 22. As the earth remaineth, there is seed, time, and harvest. So every time I say to my wife, I love you, darling, what happens is I'm planting a seed in the atmosphere. Praise the Lord. And then all of a sudden, I'm starting to say that, and then all of a sudden my faith Follows what I say out of my mouth. Then Hebrews 11, I think it's verse 13, he says, I can frame my world by the words of God. I can frame my world. So when I say I love my wife, I'm not telling you you're not going to be challenged. <laughs> uh, we went to Popeye's yesterday because we wanted something quick. And um, they had the special was the family special. And I don't like mac and cheese. She wanted coleslaw. I like red beans and rice. But he says, you only get two sides. I said, would it be possible if you take one of those sides and just give me, you know, half coleslaw, half whatever? No, we can't do that. So I said, okay, well, give me the mac and cheese and give me the uh, uh, red beans and rice. And give me a side of coleslaw because my wife wanted it. Well, when I got home and opened the bag, they gave me, I think, four or three or four of those little servings. You could have taken one of them and made it coleslaw instead of making me buy an extra coleslaw. But the point I'm trying to make, the chicken was so good, I forgot about it. 
That's the point I'm trying to make. I'm trying to remember the good things. Because when you drop down to verse 9 in Genesis 9, now behold myself to establish my covenant with you. You're in a covenant with you and your wife. And you have to go to God on how to have this covenant fulfilled. Because you made the commitment, you opened your heart, you made yourself vulnerable. Because I see that, uh, Pastor Dennis, planting a seed in the atmosphere is also planting a seed in the spirit. Because God's listening to what you said and so are the angels so they can fulfill what you desire. You know that? I don't want my angels sitting around saying, Lord, I wish he'd say something I could do. Because the ministry of spirits can only do what the word says. And they can only be fulfilled by your level of faith. So if you will keep planting seed, look at verse 9. Now behold myself to establish my covenant with you. Remember, you in covenant with your spouse. Covenant means more than uh, I swear on my pinky, on my little pinky finger. Uh, that's a, <laughs> we used to do it when we were kids. You telling the truth? Yeah, I swear on my pinky finger. And we would take each other, we would connect both our pinky fingers and say, pinky swear, pinky swear. And that had about no commitment whatsoever because soon as something else come up, we either forgot it or we changed our mind. But marriage is a covenant before God with your spouse and with you and your descendants after you. In other words, I'm going in the covenant. What I say, what I do with my wife will bear rule and will show up in my, in my family, in my children's children's children. Verse 10, and every living thing that is with you the birds and the cattle, every beast of the earth with you and all that comes out of the ark, even every beast of the earth, I establish, verse 11, my covenant. He's trying to tell you. Remember, God doesn't change, so you got to look at the big picture. When you come together in a covenant agreement marriage, a marriage that God has ordained according to his word, and the leadership of his spirit. He put you together. Remember what he says in verse 1. So you can be, you can multiply. That you can produce. You can fulfill what God told you to do upon this earth. God does not waste time. That's why he makes everything biodegradable. Everything will, will, will fulfill each other. And he wants you to use that time to let him develop you in your marriage. And one of the key things for your marriage to succeed is to remember how significant, how beautiful your wife looked walking down that aisle, how wonderful her caress or her voice is. I know, because I, I, I married a South Louisiana woman, they boisterous. When they just... You think they fight, but then they're just having a good time. They get in that room and they start cackling. My father always said, come from that dynamite hole. Because my, my, my mother-in-law and her sisters, most of them lived in the New Orleans area. And they also lived near each other. So they would start talking at one of the other's house. And as the sun started to go down or nightfall, they would walk to the other one. But what they ended up doing was going back to each other's house still talking. <laughs> and so they would do it for hours. But you know, that's a beautiful thing. See, I had to embrace it because I didn't have a, a, a sibling in my house. God had to give me mine through marriage and through supernatural. Look at verse 11, Genesis 9 and 11. I established my covenant with you and all flesh shall never again be cut off by water of the earth. Neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. This is a covenant he's making. He's also making an everlasting covenant with you because you're married to the woman or the man of God he called you to marry. And look at verse 12. And God said, this is a sign of the covenant. 
What's the sign of the covenant? God blessed it. God ordained it. And there is multiplication. There's increase. If there's no fruit in the marriage, then you could be out the will of God. And I'm not trying to put you down. I'm just giving you the word because this is what changed my whole thinking about marriage. Because I watched um, Ozzy and Harriet. They never argued on TV. I didn't know that wasn't the way a real marriage worked. <laughs> so as soon as we got married and we started to aggressively stand our points, I'm like, Lord, what am I going to do with this? This woman don't back down. But I've learned to remember. Remember the covenant. Remember the fact that this person is willing to share their life with you. Because you can be like your boy Homer. <laughs> Read your Bible, study. I don't say not Homer. Hosea. Her name was Homer. Hosea was told by God to marry a hoe. Lord Jesus, <laughs> why is that so familiar with God in the church? Because Homer was unfaithful, and God knew she would be unfaithful. And God knows that we will screw up and not be faithful. But he says if you repent, you can come back, and he'll treat you like you never did it before. But you got to remember, because I, I, I'll go through this in a few moments when I lead people into the Lord. You are totally, completely forgiven after we pray this prayer. With God, you still may have to pay back for the cars you damaged or the lives you hindered, or you may have to give your life because of the mistakes you made, but at least God forgave you for being a fool. He says in verse 12, God said, this is a sign of the covenant which I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you, for it is all successive generations. God wants you to be in covenant with him because he got a plan. This is what I love about God. He always got a plan. <laughs> he knows exactly what he's going to do. He knows exactly what you need to do to get out of what you're going through, to get you over it. I like this. I like what he said. Look at verse 16. When the bow is in the cloud, then I will look upon it to remembrance, the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. He's talking about the rainbow. I know, you know, they're trying to change the use of the rainbow to represent something else. But this was in the Bible before any of these other entities chose to do different things with it. And the rainbow, according to a believer, is a sign of the covenant. Because I think since I've been in Monroe or the Monroe area, I've seen more rainbows than I've ever seen in my life. Maybe because I'm in the country. I don't know. But it was a sign. When you see a rainbow... I'm talking about the one in the sky. That's a sign of God's covenant between a God-fearing God, a God-fearing man and a woman. Is that you? In verse 17, and God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established because me and all flesh that is on the earth. Remember, God didn't take his word back. <clears throat> Excuse me. He never goes back on his word. So all I got to do is find it in his word, find it where he did it for somebody. I match the word. I match the belief. I match the faith. Presto, supernatural, I got it too. Because God never, ever goes back on his word. So if God can save my marriage, if God can change my, my visions, change my thought pattern, he can do the same thing for you if you let him. But you know, God reminded me because I've been working on refuge the last few Sundays, working on the benefits from God, because I've met ordained ministers who never learned how to trust God. 
They still had fleshly issues. They were more ruled by their, their, their flesh than their spirit. And God wants you to know, I am able to do this for you if you let me. He says, the rainbow is a sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Now listen, this was written long before anybody else tried to change the use of the rainbow. It's a sign of the covenant. It means allegiance. It means agreement. And you know, they've corrupted this word because the word confederacy means union. But because of the misguidedness of the, uh, of the United States, they use that word to try and destroy the country that God gave them access to. And see, this is why it's so difficult for people to understand. You can't be blinded by your greed or your hatred because you're going to lose. There's no way you can keep somebody down who God's going to raise up. I don't care how much you beat them. I don't care how many plots you make. You cannot stop them. Because when God calls them forth, they got to rise. Ask Jesus. It wasn't the way he necessarily wanted it. Because I, I do remember when he said, Lord, if there be any other way. But I do remember these words. Not my will, Father, but thy will be done. And what God is trying to get us to the point where, <coughs> excuse me. The will of God is for you to remember this wonderful creature that, that God birthed in another city, another nation, another com community just for you. Because <laughs> I can trace back to September 2nd, 1977, where I just happened to be in New Orleans for the weekend. And I happened to be at a place and I bumped into this PYT, pretty young thing. I happened to bump into her, and we exchanged numbers. My, my exchange of number was, hey, look, you know, when I'm in New Orleans again, maybe I'll call you and we'll go do this. And she's saying, well, if I'm ever in Baton Rouge, I'll look you up. We had no idea what God was going to do in our marriage, in our lives. But look at Luke chapter 1, verse 54. Luke chapter 1. Because I need you to remember this. Because he said this in Luke 1 and 54. He has given help to Israel. Now we are spiritual Israel. His servants. And in remembrance of his mercy. So I believe God reminded me of this scripture because if God can give you mercy, and oh God, he has. If he can be merciful with you with all the craziness, the stupidest things you did against him and against yourself, if he can give you mercy and God is living in you like the scripture says, that same spirit of mercy should be in you. So that means that you can forgive the other person. Now, I always when I say that, I have to say this. Just because I forgive you, does not mean I'm a fool. I'm not a fool. If you won't change your behavior, and your behavior is detrimental to our relationship, to our trust, to our physical being, then I'm going to love you, I'm going to forgive you, but I'm not going to be a fool for you. But he says, remember. He says, remember the mercy of God. That same mercy should be in you because you're going to have to use this in your marriage. I'm just telling you. You had to use it in your children. I had to use it with my son. I bought him a nice bike and, and we were staying in an apartment complex. He let somebody steal it. Well, I could have just got the belt and, and spanked his butt or I could have just thrown him out the house. He was a preteen then. Uh, I could have just thrown my house. I said, I don't have nothing else to do with you. No, I use it as a training moment. So I said, son, let's pray and ask God to reveal to you where is the bicycle. 
And we were staying in a complex that had about three or four hundred units in there. But we went we went two or three uh, uh, duplexes, and there the bicycle was. Because I got to show mercy, and mercy's got to show up in my house first. Because if I can't be merciful at home, how you expect me to be merciful with everybody else? Because this is what gets me with people. Because I watch them. You're driving, and somebody upset you with their driving. Let's say it was it's totally their fault. They cut in front of you, or they took your parking place, or uh, they ran a red light. I've had that happen right in front of you. And you start getting out your car, getting your gun, shooting holes in your tires. And you hurting your own silly self. And that person is gone. They don't even know they made a fool. Oh, oh, yeah, I love this one. When they cut out in front of you and they try and make like they didn't see you. <laughs> yeah, I know you saw me. That's why you won't look my way. But what I'm trying to get you to hear. If mercy is going to begin anywhere, it's going to begin in my house. I'm going to show the woman of God that has given me her life shared her beautiful body with me, loved me unconditionally, bore my children, I'm going to give her mercy. And I have to remind myself before I get too familiar or before I start thinking, well, you know, she's been here 40 plus years. She, she's not going anywhere. No. You better treat her right. What's the old song? Treat her like a lady. <laughs> I share this with you know y'all. I know y'all not gonna tell anybody, but I'm I, I, for, I, I lack of a better term. I'm a sleepy headed driver. It's like that. That's when I start to drive, I get so sleepy. I can't hardly hold my head up. So what I do is I get on the phone and I call somebody, or when we're together, she will pick out those old long song, love songs we used to listen to. Before, before, when we got, before we got saved. And what happened was, that's what gave me this message today. Because we had to drive back from South Baton Rouge this morning. But that's what reminded me. He says, we were singing some of these songs, and we have to remember the great memories that we have together. Because um, I asked the church, I said, uh, have you ever heard the song, A House Is Not A Home? And they said, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I said, do anybody know who wrote it? And somebody said, Luther Vandross. Nope. You'd be surprised. It's been recorded probably about, I think, six or seven, or maybe eight different talents. The song was written or released for a movie in 1964 by Burt Backrack. He's 94 years old. He made Dionne Warwick who she was because he wrote uh, The Girl from Ipanina and um, I can't think of the others right now. But uh, he was a prolific songwriter, but this song never took off. He used it for a movie. Dionne Warwick sang the lead, never took off. Uh, if I remember correctly, um, uh, Mary J. Blige sang it. And a couple other uh, outstanding voices sang it, never took off. But when Luther Vandross sang it, it changed the whole song. Now it gave it life again. Because the whole premise of the song was a house is not a home, and a home, and a house, is, I'm sorry, a room is not a room, and a house is not a home without someone living there. And then he goes to that point and says, I love this point, he says, he says, when I turn the key and look up the stairs, oh, please be there, still in love with me. You need to remind yourself why you went to the, ish, the trouble to join your life with the woman of God, a man of God that God called you. You prayed for this. Because one of the things as I was preparing for this, God reminded me, all of us have been there more than once. And you're not the first person 
to desire and believe God for something. And then when you get it, you realize you got to work. <laughs> My favorite is these people, oh, pastor, pray for me to get a job. Then you get the job. How the job? I can't stand it. Well, well, you pray for the job, but they want me to work. <laughs> I try to tell people, um, uh, I found out when my income and I was in management went over a, 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 a very high level for, for most people. There are people want me on call 24-7. They want to come. And then I realized what it is. When they paying you this kind of money, they won't return. Why you think um, they spend all the money on them basketball players and football players? They want championships. I'm not giving you no $50 million or $80 million just for you to sit on the bench. I'm paying you this kind of money because I want to win. But all I'm trying to get you to remember you're going to have to love. Remember you love her. And listen, love is like a beautiful flower. It will blossom and grow, but you got to nurture it. You got to call for it. You got to refuse not to let hatred have more authority than love. Because let me tell you, and money get funny, you get called all kind of stuff. <laughs> My, my father-in-law was a longshoreman. That man, he, he unloads ships on the river in the New Orleans area. And, and what they would call it, when they didn't have ships coming in, they would say the river's slow. River's the same speed, but they just talking about not enough ships to come in to get a ship or make some money. And my mother-in-law told him, so you better get out there and find you a ship. And he told her, I can't make these people come with their ships. <laughs> I want to hear that. We got four heads of cheering and ourselves that need to eat. Get out there and make it happen. And he did. He did it reluctantly. But he says in Luke 22, 19, because he tells us this when we take, when we take Holy Communion. Well, you should use this to remind you that when I'm with my spouse, this is a covenant relationship that I prayed for God for, and I'm praying for God to maintain. Because it's going to take both of you praying, both of you seeking God, because you have an adversary trying to destroy it. Because he says he, he's the one that seek, I'm sorry, the thief coming not but to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus says, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I know the dress was beautiful. I know the occasion. Everybody came. Everybody was fed. Everybody was talking about, oh, she looks so beautiful in the gown. But then what do you do after everybody gone home? It's just the two of y'all. <laughs> You're so tired from all them festivities. What, the night you thought you were going to have, you didn't. But remember, don't give up because it didn't happen the first night. Keep working on it. Marriage is like breathing, baby. The more you breathe, the better it gets. <laughs> Keep breathing. He says, this is my body, which is given for you. Remember, that's what you did, right? You gave your body to your spouse. So that means in the eyes of God, you are one. Now, you're not by yourself. You can't make these decisions without God anymore. You are with, you're united, and you need to make decisions together. Because let me tell you, I heard it for the longest. I hear it every now and now. When we had just built a house and we hadn't done landscaping, how I bought a boat <laughs> for the landscaping. That's all I heard. When you go to the land, well, for me, I bought the boat in November because I figured I could get a better deal. Because they want to sell them in November. They don't want to be tied to them during the winter. It wasn't any sense to me to, to do the flower bed, but I had to listen until March. But let me tell you this, my brothers and sisters. When March came, we got some landscaping. But I still had the boat, too. <laughs>
He says, do this in remembrance of me. Remind yourself the significance, the purpose, and the honor of having somebody that you can call your spouse, somebody you can share your life with, someone you can have children with, someone that you can encourage and they can encourage you, someone that's going to say, oh, look at the beautiful couple. Why? Because this is what mankind is looking for. Are you a good witness for marriage? Because if there's anything I can do, I want to make sure I'm a good witness for marriage. I want to be that good witness. I want to be that one that, that uh, shows up to my wife with, and get excited about seeing her because they tease me because we've been busy. And uh, she went to New Orleans on Saturday, then came back to church on Monday. Then the day we had to go to Baton Rouge, we were rolling. But um, my kids would tease me about, oh, you were lonely. Hey, look, y'all better bring my wife back safe and sound. That's why I'm praying for y'all. I'm praying for my family. Let me remind you what God said through Jesus in John 3 and 7. Marvel not that you must be born again. He's telling you the secret to success. You cannot have everything we're dealing with because if you're not with God, what I'm saying will go over your head. But we're trying to get everybody under the sound of my voice to confess Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Because God wants to bless you. He wants to strengthen you. He wants to put you in a place where every desire you pray will come to pass. So repeat after me. Close your eyes, open your heart, and say these words. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, you promised me that if I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus Christ suffered on the cross for me, he was beaten beyond human recognition for me, and he died on the cross for me. But on the third day, God, you raised him from the grave, and he's now seated at the right hand of the Father. And so now, with the privilege and honor you've given me, Father, I decree and declare that Jesus Christ is now my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you, Father, for now I am born again in Jesus' holy name. Well, praise the Lord. Glory to God. That prayer was based on Romans 10 and verse 9. Now listen, I said this earlier and I need to repeat it again. In 1 John 1 and 9, God wants to forgive you, but you got to ask. You don't want to walk around with unnecessary sin. You can, get, you can get forgiven from God. You still may have to pay a price in the natural, but God will help you. He can't help you if you chose sin over him. So say this prayer with me. Say, Father... I repent of anything I've done against you, my fellow man, or even myself. You're faithful and just to forgive me. So by faith in the glorious name of Jesus, I'm totally, completely forgiven. In Jesus' holy name, well, amen, amen. There's a third part to this. Um, it's God's plan. He says, I gave pastors after my own heart. And he wants you to be part of a local church. So if you're not, ask God to show you. And I guarantee you, he will. He needs you to be in a place that you can learn how to love God, learn his word, learn how to come before him, and learn how to pray. Because God has already made these provisions for you as well as for each and every one of us. So, listen. If you fit in any one of those categories, give us a call. We have a, a prayer line that you can call 318-215-6399 because each Tuesday at high noon we have corporate prayer. In other words, we pray for the needs of others, elected officials, everybody that comes to heart or something we write about, write to us about. So we want you to take time. It's only 30 minutes. If you have time on high noon Tuesday, come on and join us. Then we'll be back on air for 
Wednesday Night Live here at our local service. And listen, our doors are open. So if you're ever in the Monroe area, Sunday mornings at 10 a.m., Wednesdays at 7 p.m., come on and set a spell and let the Lord bless you as we go before God and receive a word that we might share with those that are open to hear, thus saith the Lord. Well, oh, I just want to say this to you before I say adieu, is that if you're having trouble making good choices or you feel like you want to hurt yourself or hurt somebody else, we have a number we like to sow into you. It's 800-784-2433. Those are a group of individuals that are highly trained to help you learn or help you get some help to slow yourself down before you hurt yourself or hurt others. Well, God bless you. You can see me on prayer tomorrow at high noon. Uh, you can see me on Wednesday Night Live. You can also catch us on Holy Spirit Broadcast Network. We own that 24-7. And you can also hear us on four more electronic internet radio. So we're getting the word out. Let us know if it's reaching you. Text tag us. Just let us know. Well, God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your day. It's your pastor, your friend, your brother, Charles Edward Brown, right here in beautiful Monroe, Louisiana. Wishing you nothing but the best. We'll see you tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Pastor Brown and Prevailing Faith Ministries want to thank you for tuning in and welcome you to email your questions, comments, and prayer requests to pastor at prevailingministries.com. Once again, this has been another episode of the Prevailing Faith Broadcast with your host, Pastor Charles.